Good morning, everyone. Look at all your smiling faces. It's great to see you. Uh, I'm, uh, th th this is nuts, isn't it? This is crazy. I mean, in, here in Brisbane, and you've traveled so far, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away. I really am. I'm just, it, it's incredible. And it's, it, it shows uh, such a hunger and a desire for parish renewal. So thank you. Thank you for what you do in your parishes. Thank you for, for your hunger, for your passion, and for your hope and being open to what the Lord wants for you this day. Um, I'm going to be uh, controlling my slides with my iPhone, so don't think I'm checking my, my emails or anything like that. So yeah, this is the, the crowning moment of my first trip to Australia. It's, uh, I've always wanted to go to Australia since I was a wee boy. As I said, I'm from Scotland. My mother's best friend's sister moved to Melbourne uh, when I was young, and, and her mother was like my second grandmother, my third grandmother. My second grandmother moved and lived in Canada. I never knew her. Um, she lived in a place called Halifax. Uh, and uh, I used to go over to her house and it was always like Aussie stuff all over the place. And I was a kid, I was given a, a gift of a boomerang. Except I do have a bit of a complaint because uh, I threw that thing and it never came back. <laughs> I think it landed in someone's yard. Uh, but it's good to be here. I'm, I'm still here even though last week I honestly thought about cancelling my trip. When Australia beat Scotland at rugby. <laughs> But then you beat England the next day and it was game on again. It was like, no problem. And uh, I'm, I'm learning to, to navigate the Scottish, Canadian, Australian dynamic. I was, I was um, on the plane last night and uh, I was asked what I wanted to drink and asked for some water. And the, the, the stewardess said, what? And, and I've been learning to speak Aussie. So I said, uh, so water, water. <laughs> so it's, it's a bit, it's a, uh, it's hard to distinguish, you know, the New Zealand accent, Aussie accent, I'm, I'm still struggling with that a little bit. I was in New Zealand five years ago and um, I found it quite confusing. Uh, I ar arrived at internationals and I was looking for domestic and uh, I asked someone where the uh, domestic uh, terminal was and they told me where I could get the chicken. <laughs> I said, I already had my breakfast, sorry. The chicken, the chicken, Kentucky Fried Chicken, okay. So, <laughs> hey, we've got to laugh, right? <laughs> Look, on a more serious note, I just want to, my hope, my ardent hope at the end of this day is that you are encouraged, and I hope that you're amazed. Now, there's two ways to be amazed. You could be amazed at some of the things I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to say about my parish, blah, blah, blah. And that kind of amazement the reaction is, that is amazing. Wow, look at what they did. Look at what God is doing over there. We could never do that because that is so amazing. And that's not the type of amazement I hope that you experience today. I hope that the amazement you experience is, wow, look what God can do with thick-skulled, weak, foolish, broken people and I really think that could happen here too. That's the amazement that I hope that you experience. I want to begin by showing you a photograph of my parish. Aha, you thought I was gonna show you a building, didn't you? <laughs> well, we, as we heard in the, the reading from the letter to Peter, uh, the letter of Peter, the, uh, you are, we, we are the church. And this is a photograph of, you might be thinking, gee, it's a pretty small parish. <laughs> It's a photograph of one of our connect groups. A connect group, I'll say more about this later in the day. Our connect groups are mid-sized groups that we have in our parish um, for people who have gone through the Alpha process. You'll hear a little bit about Alpha today. I've, I started using Alpha 15 years ago. I said I'll start using it until I find something that works better and I'm still using it. Because we see results, life transformation, People encountering Jesus, experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, coming alive in their faith, falling in love with the Eucharist, with the sacraments, with Scripture, taking their place in the mission of the church, taking ownership of the mission of the church, and not just people in the pews, but people who didn't even go to church. Right now in my parish, we have our, our evening alpha is on right now as we speak. It's on right now. We have 200 guests at our two alphas together, and 43% of those guests are not churchgoers. Isn't that cool? 
I love it. It's amazing. It's amazing. And uh, after Alpha, we try to get as many people back as possible onto team. We always try to have, in any Alpha, 50% of the team to be first-time team members. That way you, you move people, you see? So often in churches, people camp out and clog things up. But the other thing is we get people into connect groups. Because in Alpha, people have a different experience of church, a different experience of community. They make a commitment to the Christian life. And they know they can't do that alone. They know they can no longer do the anonymous Catholic thing. And so we have these groups, and currently we have 14 of them. We have between four and 500 parishioners who are in these groups. They meet in homes every two weeks. How do you get 30, 25 to 35 people in someone's house? Well, we have big houses in Canada. <laughs> Not really. Have you ever had a party? It's the same deal. People sit on the floor, sit on the steps. It's total chaos. It's great. And these are, this is one of, we've got four family-friendly connect groups. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is because I've always dreamed that something like this could happen in a parish. Where people gather like this, these groups are lay lads, they have a meal together, they, they have a time of singing and praying together, someone gives a talk. About five weeks ago, um, just independently of one another in one week. And two of our connect groups, one connect group, a 14-year-old -year girl gave a talk on the importance of community to live the Christian life to her connect group. I found out about it on Twitter. And two nights later, a 12-year-old boy gave a talk to the, the, the whole group, adults, everyone, on the importance of being open to change in the church. 12-year-old boy. I'm loving it. It's amazing. I, I love it when this stuff happens and I don't even know it's happening. It's great. But we do support the leadership. Anyway, I'll say more about this later, but the point is that it's not just what happens in the groups, the prayer, the, the sharing, the praying for one another. It's what happens outside. Our parish is becoming a community of communities like what Pope Francis speaks about, like what Pope Benedict spoke about, what Pope John Paul II spoke about, and it's amazing. Okay, so that's a picture of some of the people. Uh, this is uh, the building. Uh, it's a newly built building, relatively new, built five years ago. Uh, our diocese went through a restructuring, a pastoral restructuring of the whole diocese because, you know, decline in church attendance and also the movement of people away from city centers to the suburbs. And we still had all these parishes half a mile from each other. And so often in the church, we, we make our first value, in spite of what we sometimes say, the infrastructure. You know, if you want to look at what's really important to us, don't, don't listen to, don't look at what people say, look at what we do, especially with time and money. And we, in Canada, not sure about here, but in Canada, if you look at what we do, you see clearly that the most important thing to us is our buildings. But our bishop at the time, Archbishop Prendergast, led a restructuring uh, which produced great fruit. And as a result of that restructuring, three parishes became one parish, and a, my predecessor, a very courageous pastor, led the building of a new church, sold the old ones. It was a very difficult thing. Um, but that's, uh, that's the building. And some of you were at our conference in June. Is anyone here today who was at our conference? They're all sitting at the back, good Catholics. <laughs> Okay, just in case, I'm not presuming anything, but just in case, so there's no awkwardness later on, uh, all this talk about Halifax, uh, it's uh, actually right there. Okay, you good? All right. Um, I want to show you a little quick video. 30 second video, okay? We're going to make sure that the audio is good to go. This is a little video of the building being built. Last year I was speaking to a group of priests and uh, we were having supper together before I gave uh, my, my first talk, and I was sitting beside a, a, a guy I was in the seminary with, and he said, James, have you, have you ever had to build a church? And I said, yeah. I said, I'm building one right now. He said, really? And he started to share with me his experience of building the church, the contractors, the plans, the, the kind of bricks, the cement, blah, blah, blah. And I was kind of being bad, right? Because the church I was building, I wasn't talking about that kind of building. I'd be a disaster at that, by the way. I told, don't, never get me to do something like that. But uh, we're building the church of living stones. And really, if anything, that's what this book is really about. You see, all my life as a priest, I've had a desire to see the church be, I think, what, 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 what God wants the church to be. Um, 
I've always had a sense in parishes that it can be better than this. You know, I was a church-going Catholic my whole life, grew up in Scotland. I've missed Mass twice in my life. Seriously. And I know I remember exactly why I missed. I'm very strict, you know, say your prayers before you go to bed. God was kind of a distant figure. I moved to Canada, got into a bit of teenage rebellion stuff, got into some trouble. My father sent me to some stupid religious weekend. And uh, I can say I, I met Jesus. I really did. I believed in this Jesus. I knew stuff about him. But I encountered the unconditional love of God in a life-changing way. And that was the beginning of my journey. And I remember just it was, it was so life-altering. And going back to my parish and feeling uh, somewhat of a disconnect because the people in the parish didn't seem to be quite as enthusiastic about all this as I was. It, because I, I, I had discovered something that I didn't have, I wanted other people who might be like me to discover this too. Because I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't have. And after a while, I began to realize they thought I was a bit weird. Now, fair enough, right? <laughs> I am a bit weird. So, uh, but, but there was a disconnect. And, and I began to look for my community among other young people who had experienced something similar. And I got involved in one of the movements of the church. And thank God for the movements. But generally, this is what happens. And I was aware of this. This divides. The people who were hungry and wanted to grow and come to know Jesus more and more and be around others with the same heart and who wanted to engage in evangelization and mission and all of these things, um, they often gathered outside of the parish, the life of the parish. And for me and many others, we went to our parish just to get communion. Because that kind of Christian living was not normal for Catholics. You're one of those weirdos that gathers on Tuesday nights, the holy rollers or whatever labels you want to smack on people. And since that time, I, I just had a, this, this desire to see that, that, that why can't what happens in the movements, whatever movement you have, the essential ingredients that make it work, they're all the same. Why can't we find a model of that that works in a parish? And since I was ordained a priest, that was, that was my passion. And I brought that passion into my very first parish and uh, ran into some obstacles right away. Now, before I continue, I just want to say a few things. Um, I'm not going to stand up here and somehow tell you that it, you know, I've discovered all the answers or that my theory, my model is the best model. All I know is that what we're doing is better than what we used to do. That's all I know. All I know is that lives are being transformed, that we've seen fruit. Our church is a more welcoming and loving place. Uh, people are encountering Jesus. People are being empowered. People are growing. People are being equipped for ministry. The people in ministry has multiplied. Our, our, our giving has, has doubled. Our, our, the people involved in discipleship has quadrupled. That's all I know. And a lot of what we've discovered, some we've, we've stumbled upon, some we've I like to talk about the case method, copy and steal everything, you know. <laughs> We're not the first ones to try this. We've, we've learned a lot from other churches, Catholic and non-Catholic, and we've made tons of mistakes. I could do a three-day se three seminar on all the dumb things I've done, all the mistakes we've made. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. But that's the risk you take when you take on the task of being a missionary church because you've got to step out of your safe place. The American pastor Rick Warren says in the church, you're either going to be a caretaker, a risk taker, or an undertaker. <laughs> so I brought this desire for renewal into my very first parish. And, and what I'm going to do for the rest of this hour is go through a few of the basic concepts of the book. Now, please forgive me if uh, the vast majority of you, of you read the book, because I asked and it said, well, some will have read the book, but not, not everyone. So I thought I'd just hit some of the basic theological foundations that are in the book before we talk about models and practices, okay? Because we need, in our church, we need a theology and a model. Sometimes people propose models that don't have a theological foundation. And there's a lot of people proposing theologies that have no, they're so abstract, they're not modeled anywhere. We, we need to have both. And that was the conviction when I wrote the book. And the theology was a result of a lot of my reflecting on my experiences of what I've, I've come across over the years. Sound good? Yep. Yep. How are you doing so far? 
All right, wonderful. Now, cards. Uh, the introduction of the book is called House of Cards. You know, my very first parish, I was ordained, I was in my fourth year of priesthood. I'd been a, my first three years, I was at the cathedral, wonderful three years. And uh, I finally got my own parish. Yes. Because I had, I want, the, the frustrating thing at the cathedral, it was more like we had a new pastor the last year, and if it, it wasn't kind of going anywhere. We were just doing stuff. Like the plan was like, fill the mass schedule. That was it. There was, there was, there was no sense of going anywhere. And I was, I was chomping at the bit. I, I, wanted to, I, wanted, I wanted to lead. I don't know what I was doing, but I know I wanted, I had that desire. And so I was given a, a, a relatively small parish of maybe 400 people outside of the city on the shore in a fishing village. And I was half-time pastor and half-time vocation director for the diocese. So I was in the parish Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And Tuesday and Wednesday, I was at the chancery. And Thursday was my day off. So I was very, very excited. Uh, I remember my very first mass there, though, this, this desire for renewal and gathering people. And, and it was like a pain in my heart. Honestly, it was like people looked so miserable. <laughs> and it, it felt like I was in a, at a zombie convention, you know? And, and people were like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, body language, I mean, it's like, Honestly, like, it looked like nobody wanted, like, we hate coming to church, is what everyone was saying. I hate the people I'm sitting with, I can't stand them, and I can't wait to get the heck out of here and go home. So shut up and let me go. Give me my communion. <laughs> and I remember having this, oh, just this, this desire. And I don't know about, you know, my, my brother priests, you know, passion is, is, you're playing with fire a little bit. There's good, you've got to have it. You've got to keep it going. You've got to keep, the, our problem sometimes is not too much passion. It's not enough passion or no passion. But passion and dissatisfaction go hand in hand. And you've got to be very careful with it that it, it because of our brokenness and our sinfulness. I don't know my brother priest, have you, have you ever experienced this at liturgy or especially when you're presiding? Because of course, everyone's looking at you, right? Like they know it's a little twitch in your muscle. Father, are you okay? I noticed uh, you had a little twitch in your muscle here for 0.5 seconds. Have you ever, because of our brokenness, have you ever gotten angry during Mass? Or is it just me? <laughs> Come on, where are, my, where are my brother priests? Put up your hands. Let's give it up for the priests. <laughs> I mean, and if I'm being honest, it, the times where I've been angry, and it's with the people, because they're not singing, they're not responding, and, and, and when I sp stop and say, Lord, what is going on with me? Why am, I, why am I getting angry with the people? It's generally not a good pastoral strategy, by the way. Um, I realize that it it's often comes from my own brokenness, because um, you know, it's even out of my own neediness sometimes uh, to, see, to, see, to see liveliness or fruit. So we've got to guard that passion and make sure that it's a godly, life-giving passion and, and not something that crosses the line. So I was, from that point on, I asked the question, I seemed to realize that like, the vast majority of people in that church, honestly, I'm talking about a personal relationship with Jesus, I'm sharing with them what I experienced, and I can see in their faces, they don't know what I'm talking about. They honestly don't know what I'm talking about. So I began to look for something, and uh, for, I met a friend of mine called Ron Huntley. I've, we were, and, and if you know, he's actually my right-hand man on my staff right now. But when we were 17 years old, we were on the, that, that stupid religious weekend I went on. He was not only on that same weekend, he was in my small group. And he had a conversion experience that weekend as well. So we had kept in touch, and he was in town. And he said, Jimmy, he calls me Jimmy. He said, Jimmy, I, I found something I think you're going to love that's going to that's really work. Uh, it's called Alpha. And he said, uh, but it's, it's English. <laughs> Me, meaning from England, you know? And it comes from an Anglican church. So it's like two strikes against it. <laughs> so he gave me the videos. Remember, uh, those of you under the age of 21, th these are uh, rectangular cartridges uh, that used to be inserted in machines, and there was a there was a ribbon like a tape that imprinted analog 
uh, sound and images on it. You check it out online, you can Google it. <laughs> um, but I sat down one day and I watched the videos. Now, let's be sure that, that, that Alpha is not videos. Alpha is a process, a 10-week process. It's, it's, it's a meal uh, done in an incredibly welcoming, non-judgmental in environment. And then there's, there, there's the talk and then the small groups. You, if you just evaluate Alpha by looking at videos, you're, you're only looking at a third of what Alpha is. But I watched the videos. <laughs> and my immediate reaction, honestly, to um, the English accents was, uh, was tough, I have to tell you. You know, I, you know, brave heart, you know, freedom and all that stuff. It's good Australian connection there, huh? And then I watched the talks, and you know, the, the Anglican thing, you know, I was kind of like super Catholic back then, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went out with a, before I went in the seminary, I, was, I went out for a couple of years with a, with a non-Catholic girl. She, she, God used her in very powerful ways, but I had, because she asked me all these questions, that I didn't know the answers about, I started studying and reading books. So I became like, you know, Mr. Super Apologist, and, and I was like super Catholic, and you know, Anglicans, pff, you know. So I watched this thing, and I have to say, by the third video, I was, I was convicted that this is somehow speaking a language in a way that I think will reach people. And I, and I learned, and, and I also had a desire to reach people who didn't go to church. And there was a lot of people in that village who didn't go to church. Uh, I met them all at the corner store. Because, you know, 400 people who went to church in a village of about 1,000 people. And that's where I found out that the reason they didn't go to church is because all the hypocrites went to church. I say, well, there's room for one more if you want to join. <laughs> so I decided I was going to do Alpha. And when I think back to the first time we did Alpha, uh, we did everything wrong. Like, we, we, we didn't... Anyway, I won't give you the list, but it was, it was, we, did, we did it poorly, and God still worked powerfully. So there you go. We actually have podcasts, a series of three podcasts myself and Ron Huntley have done called How to Kill Alpha in 10 Easy Steps. <laughs> because between us, we've got like 30 years experience running it in, par in a parish context, and we've made every dumb mistake you can make. I like to say, why learn from your own mistakes when you can learn from ours? <laughs> so I wanted to do Alpha. Now, remember, I'm part-time vocation director, right? So the only night of the week, if I'm in the parish Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, what night of the week is the only night I have to do Alpha? Monday, Monday night. Uh, Monday night. People aren't going to come on Friday night. But there was a problem. You see, Monday night, there was a card social in the parish hall that had been going on for 640 years <laughs> with some of the original members. <laughs> or so it seemed. Now, I, I got a little confession. I tell the story in the book, but I'm about to tell you something that's not in the book. I got a bit of a confession to me. I was a bit bad because it used to drive me crazy. I, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to articulate what drove me crazy, but before I did the Alpha, I started to do Bible studies. And again, the only night I had was Monday, Monday night. And I'd enter the church hall, and there'd be like 80 people playing cards. And 90% of them, never went to church. And we would have to go to this little back room, 12 people, to do our Bible study. And I used to think, this, this is preposterous. This is ridiculous. Here we have, we're, we're, we're being gifted with being the, the stewards of the most incredible, life-changing person in gift, in message there is in the universe. And we're stuck in a back room, and the main hall is full of card players. And one, one and I used to walk through with my Bible, and, and I, I don't recommend this, this was kind of naughty, but I, at one point, I, one day I, I went and I pulled up a chair. They're all, they're very serious. Have you ever spoken to card players when they're playing cards? <laughs> Not as bad as bingo players, mind you. <laughs> I mean, you say hello, more than hello, they're gonna kill you, you know? <laughs> but I pulled up a chair <clears throat> and I cleared my voice and I said, can I, everyone, can I have your attention, please? And the whole place froze. And they all turned up, like, what the hell is he doing? And I opened my Bible and I said, I'm just gonna preach to you for a few minutes, okay? <laughs> And the looks, and then I said, oh, I'm only kidding. It was only a joke. They didn't think it was very funny. <laughs> so anyway, a couple of months later, we decided we're going to do Alpha, right? But it, it's the card social. Well, word got out that I said, you know, Monday night's the only night. Well, the, the, the fan hit the wall, and we had to have an emergency meeting the pastoral council. And I was, Father James, I really don't, th I think you should back down on this. You really should back down. And I said, no, we've, this is what? 
Like, what's her purpose? Like, why do we exist as a church? This is preposterous. People don't know Jesus, and we're playing cards. And so we, we, we decided to go through with it, and um, the following Monday, I was walking through again to my Bible study, and this little old lady, God love her, she's gone to her reward. No? Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God bless her. But she's, if you've read the book, the opening line, we don't need, we don't need Jesus, what we need is cards. That's what she actually yelled at me. And, uh, and um, right then I knew I was doing the right thing. I was doing the right thing. And you know, in the three years that followed, we had went to have alphas with 80, 100 people in a small fishing village. People were, were, were having conversions, coming back to church, experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. Two years later in this little parish, we, we ran, the, the diocesan youth office closed down for a couple years. We ran a diocesan youth conference. We brought in a, a band from Texas, a little fishing village. We, we, and it was the people that did this because they had encountered Jesus and taken on the mission of the church. And people say, oh, what you're talking about, it can only happen in a big parish like yours. No, it can happen in a small parish like yours, in a medium-sized parish like yours. It can happen in a rural parish, in a suburban parish, in an urban parish. It really can. Four, year, uh, four years after I began at that parish, I was moved into the city to another parish. And um, they didn't have cards there, but they, the hall was used by scouts, cubs, beavers. <laughs> and again, I wanted to do Alpha. There was no night of the week where we could even use our own facility to help people come to know Jesus. And we had to have conversations about that. And it was, it was difficult. And then the next year, they gave me a second parish a mile away. And I was supposed to amalgamate the two of them. And they did have cards. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. My first year there was my, I was finished as vocation director, but we hosted the first annual Canadian vocation directors conference. And we had all the vocation directors come. It was hosted at this church. A couple of bishops came. And what the card players kicked them out of a room. They told them to get out because <laughs> they had to play cards. So the bishops got up and left, sorry. <laughs> Gonna play cards. And so we had the great card, card battle and everything. And oh, I gotta tell you another story. Can I tell you something really quick? So let, I'm jumping around, I know, sorry, I do that. So let's go back to the fishing village. So after my first year, they gave me, it seems to be a pattern here, they gave me another parish, a second parish. So I had two parishes half time. Well, in this parish, See, what had happened in, in Herring Cove, it was called, we had said to the card group, look, you can have the hall any night of the week, any day of the week, any morning of the week, just not Monday nights. Nope, not good enough. They left. <laughs> okay. Got this other parish. We had the most terrible catechism program there. Like kids, it was like medieval torture. <laughs> like, I visited the class, the kids were like, like this. I'm like, we're teaching them to hate God. We're teaching them to hate church. Let's scrap this and have a fun kind of youth group experience. But the only night we could do it was a Tuesday night. And guess what happened in the hall on a Tuesday night? <laughs> Cods. Cods. And the exact same group who were in my church on Monday nights. The reason they couldn't play cards in my hall any other night of the week is because they played cards somewhere else every night of the week. So we kicked them out. <laughs> okay, so let's fast forward another 10 years or something when I first went to St. Benedict Parish. And I'm thinking, th oh, in my previous, that second parish in the city I got to, they had a basketball league. People all over the place playing basketball. Again, our, our whole facility is taken over by community groups and we're impeded from doing what we're meant to do. It was crazy, it really was. Um, so I begin my year at St. Benedict, brand new church building. I'm thinking, fantastic, clean slate, none of these issues to worry about. I walk in the door, my very first day, I find out that the hall has been given to the scouts on Monday nights until the second coming of Jesus. <laughs> And on Tuesday night, a card social, <laughs> card social. And the only night of the week that we could do alpha was Tuesday night. Couldn't believe it. You couldn't make this stuff up. I'll tell you a funny story. We spoke to the scout leader, 
who had uh, been a convert. He'd come through RCA about 20 years before, and uh, he was really upset with me and very kind of angry, and I wasn't sure, is he going to leave the church or not? And for the first couple of years, he was very, very standoffish and suspicious. Well, eventually, he did took Alpha, had a massive conversion experience. Now, he's one of our Connect Group leaders. It's hilarious. It's great. It's, he's just amazing. Anyway, so what did we do? We said, OK, you can have the hall for the first couple of months because we're going to launch Alpha. We're going to launch Alpha in January, but we're going to train people up. And we put out a call in the church for, for training people. 160 people came, and we went in and we shared the space. And I walked into that building, and I'm not kidding you. 80 percent of them were the exact same people I kicked out of my first church 10 years ago. <laughs> same people, and they still gave me that look. <laughs> So I'm spending more time in this than I probably should. But what's underneath all of this? You see, what we do arises out of who we are, our sense of who we are. I believe our fundamental challenge is that we have an identity crisis, an identity crisis. We have forgotten who we are as a church. We, we think of mission. Now, we, we know that mission is not just what people do in far off places anymore. We know that intellectually, but in terms of our own experience of church, we, we know that we probably should be missionary in some way. We'll get to it eventually. But it's not what we do, it's who we are. We are missionary. Like what Pope Francis said in the Evangelii Gaudium, uh, I am a mission. It's not a badge I can take off, it's who I am. And we've forgotten it. And it's not the first time, I believe, that the people of God have forgotten this. Has anyone here ever been to the Holy Land? Anyone? Yeah. I, I love going to the Holy Land. I've done, led a number of pilgrimages going back this year. And one of my favorite times is when we go to Jerusalem. And this is coming down the, the, the Mount of Olives. There's the guy with the, the donkey up there. Uh, don't take a photograph of him. He'll ask you for money. He's been there for like 20 years. He doesn't age. And giving him money is not the worst thing. I gave him money, and he planted two big sloppy kisses in each cheek. And uh, it, he was, <laughs> smelled pretty ripe, too. So anyway, so don't, don't take the guy's picture. Um, but you get down to um, the, the church of Dominus Flevit, uh, the Lord Wept, where it has a beautiful view of the city. And you can see the view there. You can see the, the, uh, the t Temple Mount. And you often hear the tour guide say, you know, when Jesus came down the hill and he went to the temple and he walked in and he looked around and he saw all the money changers and he got really upset and kicked them out. And fair enough, that's certainly the reading that some of the, the versions of the, of, in the synoptic gospels and John's gospel that, that we get. But if, I was really struck once when I looked at Mark's version of the cleansing of the temple. It's very different. Um, it tells us that you know, Jesus come down the Mount of Olives, Olives, very intentional about what he did, right? Fulfilling the prophecy, coming through the, the, the proper gate from the right direction with the right hymn and the right animal. Uh, Father Robert Barron says it would be like entering Washington, D.C. in a stretch limo with a police escort with U.S. flags. Who are you claiming to be when you do that? Pres well, let's not talk about the President of the United States. Anyway, um, but... Um, so Jesus, everything Jesus did was intentional. It was not accidental. But now we're supposed to believe when he walks into the temple, all of a sudden the intentionality goes out the window. He just gets really mad and starts flipping tables. No. This was a prophetic, an intentional prophetic gesture. And we know it from Mark's gospel because we hear that Jesus went into the temple, looked around, realized it was supper time, and went to Bethany for supper and to stay the night. And he came back the next morning and started flipping tables. He wasn't like, oh, look at this, I can't believe this. He, he was a faithful Jew. He'd been going to his, the temple his whole life. The, all this marketplace stuff, this was, this was a regular part of temple life. I mean, what did they do in the temple? What's that? <laughs> Played cards. Yeah, very good. That was awesome. Um, they killed animals, right? That was the center of the, of the worship, the, the sac sacrificial offerings, doves and lambs and bulls and all of this. So you had to buy your animal. I mean, unless you're going to carry a bull from like, like Nazareth, you know. Um, so you bought animals and they had their own currency. Why? Because people came from all over the world and all, all different nations. And, you know, yeah, your exchange rate was pretty exorbitant and stuff. But th this was just a natural part of it. What does Jesus say when he does this? 
two passages of scripture. My house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. You have made it a den of robbers. We generally say, well, interpret that to mean, well, you're supposed to be praying here and you're selling stuff so, and you're ripping people off because you're selling it at too high a price. That's how we think of this, right? But I don't think that's really what's going on. Because if you look at what Jesus did in Mark's gospel, it said that he turned over the tables of the money changers and he stopped people from going, he wouldn't let anyone go into the temple or come out of the temple. He, he didn't just upset the money changers' tables, he shut down the entire thing. He shut it all down. And he quotes these two passages. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. If you go to Isaiah 56, 7, which we're going to do right now, Listen to the context. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. This is one of the great prophetic utterances of the inclusive, the vocation of inclusivity of Israel. This vocation of inclusivity that began with the most exclusive choice in the history of the universe. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. The choice of God of the people of Israel, it's exclusive. It's one of the mysteries. Why did God choose that people? Don't know. He just did. God chose them. There is no other nation under earth, earth like Israel. But the, in the end, the vocation was to, so that all peoples, all, all nations, all, the Gentiles can come. And that was the significance of the temple. Listen to this prophecy. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of, house of prayer. They will bring burnt offerings. This house was meant to be for the Gentiles, for everyone together. And yet... The very architecture of the temple at the time of Jesus, this is obviously a model, um, it was an architecture of exclusion. The walls, little diagram here, you see there was the, the court of the Gentiles. That's where the Gentiles could go. The Gentiles could go, but only to the outer limits. You couldn't go any further. Any, the next place was the court of Israel. Women were allowed there, but then the women couldn't go any further. Then there was the court of the men. Then there was the court of the priests. Then there was the Holy of Holies, and only the high priest could go there. See, when Paul says there is now, now no Gen Jew or Gentile, male or female, he's talking about the, the walls of exclusion in the temple. And when we have a holy priesthood, that we're all high priests. Because of our baptism, we all go into the Holy of Holies. That's what we do at the Eucharist. You see what this means? It's the fulfillment of the prophecy. All people shall come. And yet, all people were excluded. Israel had forgotten her vocation of, of inclusivity. Israel had, in a sense, had forgotten her mission to reach out and bring in all peoples. Israel had, had become decisively non-missionary, effectively. And in many ways, so has our church in our own time. And in that way, I believe, now this is my interpretation, but when Jesus said, you have made it a house of thieves, a den of robbers, he was saying to the religious leaders of the time, you have stolen for yourself what is meant for everyone. You're content to keep it all to yourself. And brothers and sisters, what is happening in so many of our churches? We're happy to keep it all to ourselves. It's all about us. And we even say the purpose of, a, of a, the role of a priest is to, is to serve the needs of parishioners. That always gets me going. No, it's not purpose of, of my role is, yeah, there's, 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 I have to feed the sheep, you know, the, the Eucharist and the Word of God, but, but I've, I've got to lead the parishioners to turn outwards, to go out into the world and to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world and to bring a message of hope, to bring the message that we prayed this morning in the Benedictus. You shall go before the Lord to prepare his way to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. That's the Canadian translation. Not turned inwards. Let's take a look at the mission of the church. Or one, one di uh, very prominent dimension of the mission of the church 
And that's found in the passage known as the Great Commission. You, we all know this. Right before Jesus ascended to the Father. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all the commands I gave you. And look, I am with you always until the end of time. Now, anyone here love English grammar? A few hands. Okay. The bishop does. That's good. Well, the four tasks, and they are go, make, baptize, and teach, right? Four tasks, right? And this is the skeleton of the Great Commission. Now, of these four verbs, now, I know some of you have read the book. You know, you know what I'm going to say here. So no talking, OK? Four verbs, and one of them, of course, is a finite verb, because every, every sentence has a finite verb. It has to. But the other three are participles. They're, they're verbal nouns. So grammatically, the sentence has a hinge. It has a center. And the participles are, in a sense, conditional on that center. They're not four equal verbs. So I would argue that theologically, the Great Commission has a hinge, has a center, around which the other tasks revolve. And which of the four is the hinge, is the question. So I'm going to invite you to guess, only those of you who haven't, who haven't read the book. So go make, baptize, and teach. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, don't worry. But the, have you got it? You made your decision? The answer is make. Make disciples. Did any, I'm just curious, did anyone choose make? Two people? Three people, four, five. And you haven't read the book? OK. You have? And you put your hand up? <laughs> Security. <laughs> Do you know what's remarkable about this? My, I've been saying this thing for a long time with different groups of people. I remember the first time it struck me, I, I was uh, 600 people. And back then, I used to get everyone to take a vote, you know, go, who, you know, get everyone to vote, and all the hands would go up. And of 600 people, six people chose make. Six out of 600. I mean, do the math. There's only four options. You'd think that generally it would break down into quarters, right? I gave this talk to in front of 3,000 people, and only like 20 people chose make. I've talked to groups of priests, and hardly anyone chose. I did, I did a talk in front of 14 bishops, and none of them get the right answer. <laughs> like, what? what is it in our psyche that blocks us to this? It's, it's not even that we just don't get it. We, we, we are almost predisposed against choosing that as an answer. Uh, Mathetusity, make, make disciples is one word. Um, What's going on here? Because our, think about it. Uh, we're generally good at going, for the most part. I mean, Catholics are all over the world. We're, we're good at baptizing, right? We're good at it where I come from. We baptize just about anything. <laughs> anything that moves and anything that doesn't move. We're good at, we're good at sacraments. We're good at liturgy. It's one of, one of the beautiful things of our Catholic tradition. And we're pretty good at teaching, for the most part. We're known for our schools and our universities and all of these things. And if you look at what we do in most parishes, what do we do? Sacraments and catechesis. Baptize and teach. Baptize and teach. And what do we not do? Make disciples. That kind of thing that happened to me when I just, all of a sudden, I came to know Jesus and I wanted to love him and serve him for the rest of my life. And that, was, that, that had nothing to do with being called to the priesthood, by the way, right? That's the whole point. Like, Wanting to serve Jesus you're, you're, and have him at the center of your life is the Christian vocation. It's not the priestly vocation. So what is it? Now, um, can I share something really geeky with you really quickly? I'm a bit of a geek. But I used to think, you know, if you looked at what we do as Catholics, you would think that the Catholic version of the Great Commission is, is, is go teach and baptize. Go teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, because that's what we do. And about six months ago, I was praying uh, evening prayer on a Sunday night, and in the intercessions said, Lord Jesus, you told your, you commanded your disciples to go and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, okay, I've been praying this for 25 years, and I've just noticed it. And then I, then I realized, we say the same thing in the rite of baptism when we bless the baptismal water. Lord Jesus, you told your disciples to go and teach all nations and baptize them. Teach and baptize. Teach and baptize. What, the, what happened to make disciples? So I... I kind of looked at the Latin, and then I looked at the Vulgate, and I found out, hey, St. Jerome, who made the, 
the Bible available for everyone by translating into Latin, he translated the word for make disciples of all nations into teach all nations. So St. Jerome's translation of the Great Commission goes like this. Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them, again, to obey all my commandments. It's go, teach, baptize, and teach again. Now, what do we do as Catholics? We go, we teach, we baptize, and we teach if they come back. Uh, we have that problem that most of them we never see again. Um, and I'm just going to skip over this for the really geeky people. There's, uh, if you don't believe me, there it is, there it is. It's, uh, it's right there. Mathetusite and docite and docentes, docite and docentes. And look at the liturgy. The liturgy is lifted right from the Vulgate. And there's the, there's the repeat of the verbs, you see? And here's the problem. See, docite and docentes. Uh, the problem is that once it gets into the, there's an expression in Latin, lex orandi, lex credendi, the law of praying is the law of believing. The way we pray teaches, informs our belief. We've been praying for 1,500 years, go teach and baptize. And we're surprised by the fact that we go teach and baptize, no matter what the latest document says, or what the Pope says, or what the Catechism says. When it comes back to it, we just keep doing what we've always done. Okay. That's enough geeky stuff. Let's uh, talk a little bit about a disciple. How are you doing so far? Are you okay? Yeah. yeah? Okay, so I want to talk to you about a disciple, okay? Because, you know, even this translation, the, the English translations that we first had, like the, the Dewey Rames Bible, it said, go, teach all nations, baptize them, and teach. Even the King James Bible says, go, teach, baptize, teach. It's only modern translations that have actually translated make disciples into make disciples. So what is a disciple? Because often we, we, we use the word disciple, apostle, it's interchangeable, right? It just means those 12 guys that hung out with Jesus. But what does disciple actually mean? It, the, the word in Greek is um, mathetes. Does that sound like a subject you took at school? <laughs> it's a similar root, same root. Because the word mathetes means one who learns. It comes from the verb to learn. You learn math. You're a student. So disciple is a student. Do we have any teachers in the house? You've known the pleasure of teaching students who, who are hungry in, to learn and grow, right? Isn't it a delight? Isn't it absolute misery when you have to teach a class full of kids who couldn't care less about what you're talking about, who have no hunger, who just want it to be over and done with? You see, you can't teach people or people can't learn who don't want to learn, who have no desire to learn. There's a story of a teacher once who was in front of his class, and he, he asked his class, what is the difference between ignorance and indifference? And there was silence. And he saw Susie, his best student. He said, Susie, come on up here. He was confident. <laughs> Susie, tell the class uh, the difference between ignorance and indifference, and he handed her the chalk. And she stood there and said nothing. And the teacher pressed her again, and she said nothing. He pressed her again, and finally she lost it. She said, look, she says, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> See, not knowing and not caring are two very different things, aren't they? But what do we do in the church? We treat problems of not caring as if it was just a problem of not knowing. Oh, you don't care. Here, let me give you more information. I don't want information. Don't you get? I don't care. I'm going to give you more information. And you know what that does? It makes people resentful. It makes people turn away even more. And I believe if all we do is give people information, if we catechize without evangelizing, without making disciples and creating that hunger in people, we make people resentful towards what we're doing. And in, whether it's our Sunday school systems or our Catholic schools, we have this problem in Canada. We have. We have the greatest apostasy rate in the universe at our Catholic schools, like 99% apostasy rate. We're churning out atheists and agnostics left, right, and center. It's amazing. And we keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. Doesn't make sense to me. Isn't that the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results? There perhaps is great potential with that model if we could actually start making disciples, but we're not. But anyway. Um, and I, we often inoculate people. You know the inoculation process. You introduce a, a weak version of, the vi of a virus, 
and the body builds up resistance so that you, can, you are unaffected by the power of the thing. And that's what I see happening in our church, that we've introduced you know, religion light, and it, it makes people immune. And it, it, it makes them you know, hearing they don't hear, seeing they don't see, as Jesus said. It, it's really tragic. I remember when I was, uh, before I had that conversion experience I told you about, I hated going to Sunday school. We, had, we didn't have Catholic schools in Nova Scotia. We actually had to get up on Sunday morning and go to school. I hated it. I resented it. And I, was, I thought it was just inherently unjust and unbiblical. <laughs> because Sunday's supposed to be a day of rest, and I had to get up out, out, out of bed and go to this, this ridiculous thing that was so irrelevant. Um, but after my conversion, I remember my aunt, my super religious aunt, who used to send us Bibles, she had a great library, and I'd go over and just, I'd, I'd leave her house with five, six books. I had such a hunger. It's like when you fall in love. Okay, ladies, remember when you fell in love? Remember when your husband fell in love with you? At that point where you say, I want to know everything there is to know about you. I want to know everything. Tell me everything. Because I'm in relationship with you. I love you. Whoa, now we can talk. Now we can do catechesis. You know the word catechesis, it comes from the word catechane in Greek, which means to echo, to sound out. So I, I, I go, hello, 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 hello. Not like that boomerang that never came back, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> it's, it's that sense of I speak and I hear back, not as a parrot would give it back, but that, that you've received it and made it yourself and you speak it back. That's the sense of catechesis. Think of standing at the mouth of a cave, hello, hello. But we're standing at brick walls. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> there's, no, there's no cave, there's no echo. We've got to make the cave first. That's what evangelization is. That's what discipleship is. And our documents, our church documents, say over and over and over again that, that we, we've got to begin with evangelization. We, you know, all catechesis should, should have evangelization in it too. They're not absolutely inseparable, but you've got to begin with evangelization. Uh, and there's a cycle of evangelization that I want to share with you. The goal of evangelization, I believe, is nothing short of making disciples. We call evangelization, we, in the church often, we call many things evangelization that are not necessarily evangelization. Um, the goal of evangelization is to, is to proclaim Jesus. Think of, you know, to give people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, to let people know their sins are forgiven. We heard that in the scriptures this morning, the beautiful enunciations of the, of, the, of, the, of the message of the gospel, and to help people to respond and receive and even to make a decision to become, as, to become disciples. I mean, Jesus said, come and follow me. They had to make a decision, and they followed him. And disciples are the ones in our churches who... Yeah, I'm getting, see, they're the ones who renew the churches... They're the ones who learn, who serve, and give. I mean, let me ask the pastors here. When you think about that definition of a disciple as someone who's hungry, who's encountered Jesus and wants to grow, they want to deepen their prayer life, they want to, they want to learn, uh, what percentage of your, of your Sunday Mass attenders does that describe? What would you say? Any guesses? Shout it out. How many? About ten. Ten? Wow, that's great. Five, two, one. one, yeah, that's what I often, I mean, I've traveled different places, this is what I hear, and some studies in this United States have said between three and six percent. And because of that, we often actually even create pastoral um, um, methods to actually uh, meet the needs of those who have no hunger. <laughs> it's like we, 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 we give people less and less because they don't want it. You know, we, we, we get... You ever had my brother priest, someone come up and say, you know, you know Father, uh, Father Smith, you know, he gives uh, three minutes on the homilies, you know, and they're very good. <laughs> three minutes, very good. I just say, well, the word of God is not fast food, sorry. I'm never, I'll make do a three-minute homily at a weekday mass, but I'm not going to do it on Sunday. I want to feed people who are hungry. I'm, I'm not really interested in people who are not hungry. And if you want to go to Father Smith's mass, go ahead. That's okay. That's okay, but we want to feed the hungry. Because if you don't feed the hungry, what happens to them? They, 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 they either die or they leave and go somewhere else. And usually, if it's desperate enough, so many of them even go to non-Catholic churches. So disciples are the ones who learn, who serve, and, and give. But you see, it's not enough to be a disciple. 
You've got the disciple has to become an apostle. And the apostle is the one who goes and evangelizes. And the more evangelization, the more disciples, the more disciples, the more the church is renewed. And the more the church is renewed, it spits out apostles. And so can more evangelization. It's a cycle of life and health. Now, what does the word apostle mean? The apostle is someone who is sent. What do we call someone who is sent in the name of God? What's the English word? It starts with an M. Missionary. Missionary. Disciples, uh, learners, have to become missionaries. Disciples have to become apostles. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't say, go and be disciples. He said, go and make disciples. And often in the church, we've got to make disciples and then help disciples become apostles. It's what I call the photocopier model of church. Okay, hands up, people who, who hate photocopiers. Okay, photocopiers... They're great when they work, but when they don't work, it's not so great. Has anyone ever uh, said a bad word to a photocopier? <laughs> okay. Has anyone ever kicked a photocopier? Because they get jammed up, right? It's not doing what it's supposed to. It's like, you stupid photocopier, poof. You're, you're supposed to copy, and you're not doing it. You're, you're not doing what you're made for. Ugh. I wonder what the Lord is thinking. <laughs> You stupid church. You're supposed to be doing this. You're supposed to be bringing people in from the outside. You're supposed to be processing them, stapling and punching them, and spitting them out to be my hands and feet, to be missionaries to the world. And you're all jammed up. Your in tray is blocked, your out tray is blocked, and your smoke coming from the inside because you're all fighting with each other and turned inwards, as Pope Francis said, a self-referential church that's sick. A church in itself, of itself, for itself. And we don't see it. We don't even see it because there are no models of health that we can compare ourselves to. We don't even know how bad it is. Now, there's going to be a, a bit of hope coming in here. So don't, don't <laughs> let's see. Do, do you know what the reason of hope is? Now, to, it's quite simple. That no matter how bad it is, God is still God. Amen? I, do we worship a different Jesus who was around 2,000 years ago? Is it a different Holy Spirit? Are the sacraments still the sacraments? Does God have a greater, a less desire for renewal for the church than we do? Well, that's why there's hope. The problem's not with God. The problem's not with, with, with the treasure. The problem's with us. Because we're more married to our method than we are to the mission, no matter what we say. Think about that. We're more married to the mission, to the method, than the mission. Pope Francis says, I want a church that goes out. Not an inward-focused church. See, an inward-focused organization is what we call a club. It exists for the sake of its members. And we've got lots of Catholic clubs all over the, all over the world. I remember a priest friend of mine from a neighboring diocese is saying to me one time, James, he said, I, it's like I'm, I'm president of a middle-class social club. He said, I, I hate it. It's not why I became a priest. It's all about me. It's all about us. They really don't give a, you know what, about, about people outside. They really don't. Like, let's leave me alone to play cards. I don't care about those people. Um, The term that Pope Francis uses is missionary disciples. You've heard him use that, perhaps. Um, again, the disciple has to become a missionary. A couple of years ago, we had the 100th anniversary of this event, April 14th, 2020. Um, I've always been fascinated by the Titanic. When I was a little kid, I watched, remember the old black and white movie, A Night to Remember? I, I watched that when I was a little kid, and I remember it's kind of a family story. I must have been like six years old, and I, it kind of traumatized me a little bit. Uh, I remember the scene. The, the, it's funny what you remember, right? When I was a little kid, there's a scene in that old black and white movie when the ship is sinking of people running around in the corridor, and a little baby's sitting on the, on the, on the, on the, the hallway crying, and the water's swishing around, and people are running past the baby. I had nightmares about that. I remember my aunt was babysitting us, and she was talking us in at night, and I said, Auntie Margaret, my Scot I had a real Scottish accent back then. 
do you know about the Titanic? He said, yes. I said, yeah. It's a big ship that hit an ice cube and sank. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the anniversary, on April 12th, um, it was quite significant where I come from in Halifax because the rescue operation was launched from Halifax. And where I used to live, the cemetery that, houses, that, that contains the, the remains of the victims whose bodies were found is buried in that cemetery about 200 yards from, from where I lived. And believe it, believe it or not, there, there, there actually is. Um, who's the, the, the character that Leonardo DiCaprio played? What was the, what was the character's name? Jack Dawson. Jack Dawson. Jack Dawson. Jack Dawson, yeah. There's actually a grave. There's actually a victim called Jack Dawson. There is. And like tour buses come, like people come from all over the world and they're weeping and, and the guy was like a 65 year old plumber. <laughs> he wasn't, it was not Leonardo DiCaprio. No, he, he, he worked in the furnace room. He was a, like a boiler room man, you know, with like the, the, the butt crack and all of this, you know, so it was, but the, all the ladies are like crying over Jack's grave. But so there's a connection with Halifax. It left a real imprint. Um, and again, on, on the anniversary, I'm a, I'm a Bit of a nerd, I said. So I, I actually sat up and watched the, um, the, the, the new Hollywood movie. And I know it's almost bizarre, but I, I kind of started at midnight, so timed it like 100 years to the minute the ship was sinking on the screen. I know that's weird, but <laughs> anyway, I did that. Anyway, it was, uh, <laughs> it was a Saturday night. I had, early, I had nothing to do the next morning, just like you know, a couple of masses and stuff. And I was watching the scene where the, where the, the ship slid underneath the, 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 the waters. And I've had a few moments in my life where I've sensed God hitting me hard. And God hit me hard that night. Do you know that 18 lifeboats were launched from the ship that night? And there was a total of 472 unused places on the lifeboats, 472 empty seats. And those lifeboats sat off at a distance and let 1,500 people die of hyperthermia. And you could say, well, they, they were afraid they would get sucked under by the ship. The ship went down, and it was over, and the place was, the, all that could be heard in the darkness was the cries for help. The people had five minutes to live. And the people in the lifeboat sat there and did nothing. I don't know why they did nothing. Fear, perhaps, that they would be overwhelmed. But what's the purpose of a lifeboat? Save to save lives, to go and rescue people. Finally, there's a very well-known story, and it's portrayed in the movie. One of the crewmen actually brought some boats together and, and strapped them together and transferred people over to go and rescue people. People complained. I think they rescued five people and, and three of them lived. Two of them eventually died as well. But as I watched that, I heard the Lord say very clearly to, clearly to me, he says, James, this is my church. We've been given a mission, the most important mission in the universe. And we sit in our lifeboats, playing cards, complaining if we have to actually put the cards down and actually do anything remotely close to what our mission is. We've forgotten our missionary vocation. We've forgotten who we are. We're happy to keep it all to ourselves. We, we paint the boats. We keep them. We maintain them. But we've forgotten that we don't just have a mission, that we are a mission. Okay, so now that we're all depressed, <laughs> it's going to get better, honestly, trust me. How are you doing so far? Are you doing okay? Yes. But I, I hope that that's, um, I want to share that with you to, to, con to convict you. And, and, and I, really need to, I really think we need to cry to God to say, Lord, please give us your heart. You know, Jesus, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that those who believe in him may not perish she said, without knowing Jesus, there's people perishing. I'm not making definitive judgments about where people go when they die, but, but Jesus is the, is the water of life. He is the bread of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We believe that the fullness of life is found in him, that he is the way to the Father, that people come home when they come to the Father's home. 
And without that, people are perishing. And Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. You've got to continue the work that I began.